Okay, we're up. We're live. Malcolm, how's it going tonight? Thanks for being here. It's going really well. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yes, sir. So just to give everyone a background of who you are and exactly maybe what we're going to be talking about it today, that way we can kind of lay down the uh, the foundation, I guess. Uh, why don't we go ahead and do that? And I, because I know you're what a master of data management, so... Uh, you, sure, you can say that. I mean, I so my my focus area is is called master data management, but I, I think you maybe you could call me a master of data management. I mean, there are there are titles of like you know master electrician and master plumber. I, you know, I don't I don't have a formal trade, but maybe if I did, I think I'd be called a master data guy. Yeah, yeah, I like that'll it. work. Yeah. So all right, so to give everyone even more of a breakdown, though, what exactly in your terms data management? Yeah, that what exactly are we getting into here? Yeah, so we're getting into the kind of the engine room <laughs> of uh, of companies, right? So all, all companies run on a platform of data, right? Sure. And and for for a lot of companies, data is largely kind of sadly a good way to it, it, kind of visualize it is the exhaust. Right now, us data people would would be clutching a lot of pearls right now and saying, oh, "What do you mean the exhaust? It's it's the new oil. It's the thing that makes everything run, and it's the insights." But data, for the most part, is a byproduct that is created when you interact with customers, when you sell things, when you capture data information about what your buyers are doing, or what they like, or what they don't like, or how well your machines are running, and all that. Sure. Right. So. So, so data is is a bit of a of, of a byproduct. It's a bit of an exhaust of of business related processes. So, companies gather all of that because it is can be incredibly powerful to help guide you in everything, all of your operations, right? The way to make your operations run better, or to support your customers better, or to perfect your products, or or to treat your employees better. It all needs data to do that, right? You need to be making decisions day in and day out. And the best way to make decisions is not intuition, is but is from the data, sure. right? So, so companies collect all this data. It goes into large buckets, <laughs> known as databases, and then that's where people like me step in, where they where they start where, where we start to apply things like, well, this data should go over here, and this data should go over here. The data all needs to be classified and needs to be labeled. Not unlike a maybe a Dewey Decimal System for for how books are stored or classified or managed, it needs to be structured. The data needs to be put into things that will allow the data to be easily accessed and easily stored and easily manipulated. That's that's what I'm really kind of referring to here is what's kind of widely known as data management. Gotcha. How do I manage the data within a corporate environment? Mm -hmm. How can I actually take that data and then um, operationalize it somehow within other systems. How can I how can I take data out of this bucket and put it over here and help the machine run further? How can I put it over here and put it into a report so decisions can be made on it? The management, the care of feeding of data within large companies, that's data management. That's where I live and breathe, and that's what I help companies figure out how to do. So what I'm picking up is it very similar to gathering like analytics about and statistics about yeah. you know, like products and stuff like so we're selling yeah. X, Y, and Z on certain days weeks months and then you know we're going to take that put it into a bucket and know that hey when this time of the year comes back around we know to kind of yep. put this product a little bit harder that that's kind exactly of right yeah so so, so ana analytics is is a is it's an analysis um <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 uh an analytics is the way to make sense of the data right analytics is the way to to, to allow human beings to make informed decisions about data it, it, it analysis is okay. Well, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, okay, well, how many people bought my product in the Northeast in the month of November? That is, that is a function of analytics, right? To be able to access that data and, and access the kind of the clean, the structured, the trustworthy, the actionable data, and then make some decisions based off that. that that's analytics. So yes, what you touched on is kind of a, a an, an area of, of, you know, where, where I live and breathe um, also known as reporting. <laughs> Fancy way of saying it or kind of reporting, but I mean, I guess a lot of the data, data science people out there and the AI people would, would would take some offense to that because there's a lot of powerful things you can do to data. There's a lot of new technology that can be applied against data to do things like modeling, right? And, and predictive modeling and guessing, like what will people do? What will demand look like? If I do the combination of A, B and C things, what's the likely outcome of that? 
what's the offer that I can give to people that is that has the highest likelihood that it will turn into a converted paid customer. So these are all forms of analytics. Data science is a form of analytics. Um, uh, even you could argue that that machine learning is 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 argued some form of analytics, but. But yeah, it all comes down to reporting it. It all comes down to helping humans make informed decisions about you know, the optimal way of doing things or the optimal, uh, optimal sure. decision or the optimal operational process. Yeah, well, I'm one of those people who enjoy gathering as much data as I can. And I guess that might be coming from, you know, I did one of those strengths finder tests one day. Oh and, yeah. Yeah, I just yeah. said I was very analytical. So yeah. I was one of those, again, I could make better informed decisions with, you know, whether it be business life or whatever, with the more data you have. And yeah. that, like you were just saying that you can almost not predict the future, but kind of predict it in a yeah. sense. And that way, you know, hey, if I make decision A over B 14 years down the road, I might be sitting pretty. Yeah, it's exactly right. I'm, I'm one of those people as well. Right. So I, I'm, 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 an, I'm an analytical type. I like to break things down into component pieces. Mm. I, I, I like to be able to understand how machines work. That's an analytical process, right? So yeah, I'm absolutely there. I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. How did you fall or get into this? I, know, I shouldn't have said fall into it, but is this something well, you- Well, kind of fell into it. Okay. Well, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. So I, <laughs> I don't know how far back we want to go. Um, I've been really focused on data and analytics for the better part of about 20 years out of a 30 year career. -ish. Okay. There's a lot of, there's a lot of gray hair there. It's, it's real. Um, and I really kind of fell down the, the data rabbit hole because I was attracted to the idea of solving problems that other people had a hard time solving. I'm, I'm a little bit of a masochist that way. And in my in my particular swim lane in the data and analytics world, I mean, I, there's a, there's a few that I occupy, but one of my favorites is this area called MDM, Master Data Management. Okay. And what Master Data Management is is all about is allowing you to have trusted, consistent, single views of things. And what a thing could be, it could be a customer, it could be an employee, it could be an asset, it could be a location, it could it, it just pick a noun. It doesn't really matter. But what happens oddly within very large companies and even governments for that exact, for that man, um, they, they will grow and over time they will acquire more and more buckets of data, right? Yeah. And believe it or not, the larger you come, you become as a company, the harder it gets to actually answer a question like how many customers do we have? Because within a very, very large company, there's a lot of kind of functional specification that would actually argue, arguably justify to have different definitions of who your customers are and under what circumstance you would call somebody a customer or not. So I really kind of got into this field when I was hired by a large company um, uh, to, to answer a question. I was a consultant. I was being paid as a consultant to answer a question of how many customers do we have? Mm. And I thought, man, this is going to be a massive layup. This is going to be the easiest consulting gig I've ever had because I will, you know, I'll put all the data, I'll, I'll go grab all the data, all the customer related data, I'll put it in one place and I'll run some reports against it and I'll easy peasy and I'm on to the next and I will be the rock star. As it turns out, that, that, ha that ended up being an incredibly difficult question to answer. How many customers do we have? This is a publicly traded company with, with audited books, with great accountants, with great finances, with great controls from a kind of a finance and audit perspective. But what I found when I went into this big company is that everybody within those various departments in that company, marketing, finance, accounting, logistics, operations, they all had different definitions of customer. Yeah. So if you ask marketing how many customers you have, they'd give one answer. And if you ask somebody else how many customers do we have, they would give a different answer. And more than that, if you kept peeling the onion on it, you'd look at the data, you'd ask marketing, well, how many customers do you have marketing? Well, we have 100, just spitballing. Sure. We have 100. And then you actually pull the data and you look at it. And it's uh, Jay Smith, Jonathan Smith, Jay Smith, and largely at all the same address. And they had three separate customer IDs. And marketing was considering that three different customers and three different people because their names were slightly different. And then you'd look at them and you'd say, well, wait a minute, hold on. John and Jonathan and JJ, and they all largely share, share the same address. There's a couple of nuances here, a different phone number, but probably the same thing, right? So even if you think that you've got relatively good data, data can be badly duplicated. And we see this within large companies all the time. You've probably experienced in your, in your personal life where maybe somebody has, has confused you for somebody else. There's, there's yep. a different Chris Scheller out there. 
Or maybe where you've, you've stayed at a hotel over and over and over again, and then you go back to that hotel and they have no idea who you are, mm. right? They yeah. confuse you for, there's a, anyway, to make a long story short, for a large company, believe it or not, answering the question of how many customers we have can be a very, very difficult one. And I learned that the hard way. And there is a certain discipline. There is a certain kind of framework that you can apply to, da- to the data to answer that question. And I figured out how to do that. But for a lot of companies, that's really hard. So that's what really kind of attracted me to the data space is that answering very, very difficult questions that companies struggle with that on the surface seem very, very simple. But when you get into it, when you dive into it, it's actually rather complex. That's the analysis portion that I really, really like and enjoy. Oh, okay. Well, with what you said there, you know, with like marketing having different data compared to, you know, the other company having different data, is there an industry standard of something like best practices in order to get gather specific types of data? Chris, I lost you. Oh, wait, you're back. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, did you, I don't know if you heard my, or got my is there, you were, you were right to, about to get to a, a punchline okay. and then, and then, and then you froze. So, yeah. oh, that's all my, my, as I said, my internet's unstable, so I don't know what's going on, but anyway. Ah. Um, yeah. So that's where I was at. Okay. So, when you said the data, like the marketing would gather, have a different data compared yeah. to the other departments or whatever, yeah. that in, is there an industry standard of best practices and get gathered data that you should follow? Or is it yeah. just kind of company B can do it, whatever they want, <laughs> company C? Well, uh, both are true, actually. Okay. <laughs> so the best practices, that's where I come in, right? So that's what I do for a living. So previous to my current position of, of, of head of data strategy for a software company, I was what's called an analyst. I worked for a company called Gartner. Okay. So, so, so Gartner is a, is a research and analytics company that hires industry experts and basically charges under subscriptions access to those experts to get insights around best practices. What's the best way to solve for problem A? What's the best way to solve for problem B? What's the best way to manage my data or classify my data or what's called govern my data in order to make sure that I don't encounter these problems? So there is there is a body of research out there. There are some experts in the space. I'm one of them. Um, there are other analysts, there are companies that focus on this that, that can tell large companies, hey, you know what, and even consulting firms, by the way. So pick, you know, pick your big six, big seven consulting company, the Accenture, Deloitte's, the McKinsey's, all of them, they all have kind of you know, patented processes around the best way to manage data. So there is a body of knowledge out there around, we'll just call them best practices, that people who are running companies can, can access in whatever way that they want to. Now, what we see consistently, though, is, is that even though there is this body of knowledge of the kind of the do's and don'ts of, of managing data, so few companies actually follow them. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different reasons why companies seem to think they're all the time that they're snowflakes and that their problems are incredibly unique when really that they aren't that unique. There's a lot of other reasons that, that kind of prohibit companies from, from following best practices. Sometimes they're just straight up skills gaps or resources gaps or leadership gaps. Other times incentives are not fully and totally aligned where you'd have a corporate leader saying one thing, we need to be more data driven, but then you have functional leaders saying, okay, well, that's not how I get paid. I get paid to do ABC. I get paid to um, manage the data however I want to manage the data. And I'm going to ignore the best practices because at the end of the day, what I follow is, is, is what's going to help me get my bonus. So there's a lot of different reasons why sometimes companies would derivate and would not follow those best practices. Um, but bo- both are true. So there, there is absolutely a, a well-established kind of body of knowledge of the things that you should be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the times those are very, very well-defined, uh, well-documented and even regulated Right. So when you get into the world of finance and banking and insurance, when you get into things like, you know, what's called personally identifiable information, data about you and who you are and ways to personally identify you, there are very, very specific rules. I mean, actual laws (laughs) that data practitioners have to follow about how to treat data. A good example is uh, health privacy um, and, and, and what companies can do or can't do related to information about your health. This takes even like subtle forms in that you have to stand six feet back from somebody when you're going to pick up your, your prescription. But when it comes to wow. like the data related to you, uh, what companies can and can't do with it, 
uh, there, there are very specific laws. So it's, it's, it's a spectrum about the kind of the do's and don'ts of data management. On one spectrum, there are actual laws uh, about what you can and can't do with data. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it's, it, it can be often uh, the wild west uh, in terms of you know, how do you manage the data? How long do you keep it? And under what way do you keep it? What rules are you applying to it? Uh, what governance are you applying to? It's the governance of the policies and procedures that, 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 that govern the use of data. So um, you name it, it goes from, from A to Z in terms of, of data. Well, looking at it though, with what you just said that, you know, it seems that, you know, with technology now and as much information data we can gather at any given moment right now, and that is there any areas where for the future that we're going to just be is it always just changing where there's not going to be that industry standard where we say, hey, we can hang on to this data for three years and then we try yeah. it or whatever. But it's just like they find some new information. I don't know. Yeah. Study comes out. It's like, nope. All right. We're going to keep it for now for one year. Who cares? Right. Well, yeah, a lot. A lot of companies have a big data hoarding problem. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, you, you mentioned you're in Virginia. If you ever fly into uh, Dulles Airport. Yep. And if you're ever landing from the north, or if you ever fly into San Jose Airport out in California, it's the exact same, by the way. If you're landing from the north and you look down, and what you see is football field after football field after football field of these like warehouses with, with nothing but air conditioners on the roof. Um, what 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 you're looking at, by the way, is the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and yeah. it, it, it's it's basically it's the internet. Sure, for, for all in, for all intents and purposes, it's not the wires that connect the nodes in the network, but it's basically a lot of the computing power for the internet is sitting in data centers in Ashburn, Virginia, and San Jose, California, and a yeah. few other places on the uh, on the planet. But so you know, a lot of companies have some data hoarding problems, but storage is finite, right? And storage does cost, right? So companies do have to make a, a trade off in terms of how long are we going to hoard data, and is there value in this data right now? Um, it, it, I, I would argue that most companies are holding on to too much data for far too long. And it's, it always kind of comes down to this hoarding mentality of maybe we'll need it one day. Yeah. Um, cause for right now at the very least storage is relatively cheap because the costs have been coming down and down and down and down and down. I happen to think though, that we are fast approaching a point where, um, this phenomenon in corporate and companies, something called ESG environmental societal and, and governance concerns. It's a big concern in corporate uh, boardrooms related to things like, are we acting in an ethical or an environmentally sensitive way or an environmentally friendly way? Hmm. So increasingly companies are making decisions through what's called an ESG lens that, that ask questions like, are, are we being good stewards of the planet? And I think when it comes to data, increasingly what you're gonna see is companies acknowledging, you know what, we're probably not being good stewards of data because we're just hoarding all of this stuff that we never knew, that we never ever use and will never use. All we're doing is taking electrical power and a lot of air conditioning to cool the servers that are sitting in Ashburn or in San Jose and a, and a few other places. And maybe we need to re revisit our policies here. So um, there's a lot there's a lot of data hoarding that's going on. But um, it's 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 interesting. You know, I've been asked often by by a lot of people who who are kind of outside this world of, that you know who are very very concerned about kind of you know access to information about them. Yeah. Right. About you as an individual and you are being tracked in a lot of different ways. I'm not a privacy expert. I, I certainly can't speak to that, but I do know that people consistently make choices that favor convenience over privacy. Okay. Right. Like how many times have you downloaded an app and you just, oh man, click, click, click. Yes. Agree. Agree. Click. Yes. Agree. Yeah. Click, click, yeah. click, click. But Google. I mean, Google. Google is tracking every search that you make for sure to turn around and try and monetize that uh, based on what it Google thinks that you want based on your search patterns, of right? Um, or, or, or Siri for it, for heaven's sakes, or all these like microphones that people are putting in their houses and listening to everything they do and say, I mean, I, I've been on conference calls where, where, where I've heard Siri being activated in the back when I'm on somebody's conference call, because it's constantly listening, yeah. it's listening to everything. Exactly. And so I've been asked a lot, like, okay, well, what about privacy and well, these big corporations and they're bad and they're they're tracking everything you do. And I was like, okay, well, wait a minute. Like, yeah, that's true. And yes, yeah, sometimes they cross the line and there's certainly kind of some creep factor going on there. But at the same time, you're the one that's that's using these products. You're the one that's clicking on all of these, these user agreements that are allowing them to track all of this data because you would rather have a free app 
mm-hmm. or free search ter- or free searching of the internet, then 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 take more active control over your data. So I'm not saying that to, to chide everybody, and I'm not saying that to, to, to finger wave, but um, yeah, there's a lot of data out there, and you most certainly are being tracked. The general rule of the thumb here is that if something is free, yeah, there's, like, there's no such right? thing as a free lunch, right? No, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, this, this is what blows me away about conversations about Twitter and free speech. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on a second, right? I, I've, I've, I've been to, to Twitter's headquarters um, multiple times. I know where their data centers are. They're sure. massive. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure to support a worldwide network of people interacting in real time with each other and sharing photos and, and chatting and say whatever you want about the quality of discourse of t- Twitter. That's that's not really kind of what I'm talking about. I'm just saying like, okay, it's free, but it's not free. That infrastructure costs a lot to build out. Yeah. So the idea that that you as a person are somehow afforded a right of free speech on a private infrastructure, on a private company that paid billions of dollars for that, I, I find that to be just kind of, it just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't pass the smell test. What, why why did, would anybody think that they should have a right to free speech on a private platform that caused billions to make? So I, I don't know. But anyway, my point being, there's a lot of data out there being the, 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 about you. Uh, it's out there. Um, I'm optimistic that in the future, I don't know, five, 10 years down the road, that there will be more ownership and more opportunities to take ownership over your own data. I think that blockchain and kind of Web 3.0 technologies here hold a lot of promise to yeah. allow you to take more control over information about yourself. But I do know that that's on the one hand, that's great. That's very cool. But on the other hand, there will be sacrifices of convenience. Mm. There will have to be. Right. Because if you are no longer monetizable, right, if you can't get if if companies can no longer cram ads down your throat because you're not agreeing to these things and you want to take more control over your web experience or over your data on the web. Well, the trade off for that is going to be maybe you're going to have to start paying for stuff that you didn't pay for in the past. And maybe that's an okay trade off. Well, I'm not trying to give you pushback or rile you up or anything, but I was just, I don't know. go for it. Uh, yeah. I was just in a, but when you're talking about Twitter and free speech and, you know, Elon's a big advocate for free speech now, and that's part of the reason why he bought Twitter. And like, I was wanting to see what your thoughts were on that and cleaning it up. And now he's wanting to charge for a verification check, like $8 or whatever it is. And well, it, it doesn't cost anything to say that you're an advocate for free speech. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, um, and, and that's okay. So I think it remains to be seen about what he's going to do. Uh, I have I have no idea. I don't understand why there was like a like backlash from people like saying, "Oh no, he's going to let you know, uh, you know, all of these bad characters back on oh, the Trump, platform, Trump and, and he's going to and he's going to replatform all of these people." And I was like, "Okay, well, wait a minute. It's his. He bought it. He can do whatever he wants to it." Correct. Um, within the existing laws of our land, right? You can't libel anybody. You can't you can't libel anybody. You 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 can't you you. There there are limitations on speech. Is he going to make it completely like what he's saying that the public square? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know how you monetize it because if that's the case, it's going to drive away advertisers most certainly sure. because the big advertisers are not going to be wanting to be associated with platforms where there is incendiary speech of whatever form. Um, so then how do you make money off it? I, I don't know. Re- I'm really interested to see where he goes yeah. with it and, and what the business model looks like there. I do think, I do agree completely that the blue check for everybody is a great first step because right now there's no accountability for poor behavior. Oh, it's just sure. none. For sure. But yeah, that's a, that's one good question though, is that, you know, when people are starting to, I guess, tweet and write again, though, like who gets the judge what's allowed and what's not allowed based on if, is that really free speech or is that breaking the laws that you were just talking about? I mean, who gets, is there a Twitter board that still gets to, you know, moderate that or what? He well, he's saying right now that he's going to create some sort of kind of content moderation committee. Okay, I don't know who's on the committee, but I do know, and and I don't know what the rules are going to be. I do know for for absolute certainty he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't owe me anything, right? Twitter is free, and he owes me nothing, and there is no debt that Twitter owes to me, and there's no obligation that Twitter has to continue to offer a free service to me or to continue to offer anything. Sure. That's, that's most certain. That's, that's one way I look at it. The other thing here is anytime that there are humans involved, 
<laughs> right? Anytime that there's committees or tribunals or whatever you want to call it, they're going to get stuff wrong. Right. Yeah, they're going to get stuff wrong. I, you know, I don't want to fall down any rabbit holes based off of what we experienced coming out of the pandemic, but we're seeing a lot of situations now where it's like, oh man, well, we got that wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Based right. Based off human emotion, based off judgments. Whatever. Or, yeah. Right. Or, or incomplete information or yeah. overreaction sure. or, or, or bias. We're human. We, mm-hmm. we all have bias because we're, we're human. So Hey, if he wants to put in a content moderation board, that's fantastic. Great for him. Um, uh, anytime humans are involved, uh, bias is involved, and all these other things are involved. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be really really interesting because you know um, again you know we're we're so polarized as a society. Um, how do you how do you keep both sides happy? You can't. Not now. I, it, right. Yeah. Not to the modern world. You can, it's like almost a certainty that no matter it's like saying that, you know, I always say this on here that oh, you see one of the greatest movies of the, whatever the past few years, you know, one of the Marvel movies or whatever, but there's always going to be a group of people who say like, Oh, you know, I hated that shit. It's like, well, right. Yeah. Well, why'd you hate it? Or, I don't know. I just hated it. Well, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know. Always. I don't know how you keep everybody happy. So maybe his business model is not keeping everybody happy. I I, I don't know, but um, I do know that the business model is what's flawed. If, if, I should say, if the goal is truly free, whatever that means, it, within the confines of, of the internet, <laughs> um, if the goal is, is free speech or as free as possible, then you need to remove the shackles of being advertised and supported. Mm. You, you you have you you have to right because if, as long as your advertisers are supported that means you are beholden to your advertisers and rightfully so by the way i'm not i'm not the the guy that's going to be out there saying big corporations are bad because they're not they pay my mortgage right and they put a roof over my head and corporations serve an important incredible role in our society so if you're going to say okay wait a minute i want it to be totally totally free and i want unencumbered speech uh you're you're going to you're going to make some advertisers mad because there will be things that are said that advertisers don't want to align to of and course. that's fine that, that's cool with them they can be aligned to whoever they want to be aligned to um but then what are you left with right you could charge people 20 bucks to get a blue check okay maybe more i don't know and then what um because i've already got discord i've already got slack yeah. i've i've already got i mean i I've, there, there's there's tiktok there's there's rumble there's and they're not charging me 20 bucks so there's other outlets yeah uh, i don't know i'm really interested to see where it goes um you know it's it, I, i'm finding a lot a lot of this very very interesting because the first 10 years of my professional career i i, st- I spent at a little internet startup called aol that's how I know about Northern Virginia is I, hey. I worked, I worked and lived in Northern Virginia. And, and, and the reason why those data centers are all in Ashburn, Virginia is, is because we ran a line down this road called 267, which AKA the toll road that goes basically from Tyson's Corner, Virginia, all the way out to Dulles yeah. airport. Up. And we put this giant fat, uh, 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 fiber optic line down the middle of that road that basically moved the east point, the east termination point of the internet from Tyson's Corner, Virginia to Ashburn, Virginia. Um, and that's why all these data centers established there, because that's where AOL's headquarters were. And it basically became this thing called May East, which, which is in essence the, the, the East Coast hub of the internet uh, that, that was the major jumping off point to Europe and to South America and all these other places. So um, I worked for an internet startup. And I, I had, I've had discussions talking about free speech and moderated speech and how do you moderate people's speech sure. and, and you know, how do you control for bad behavior on these platforms? And, you know, almost 20 years ago, that was very different than now. It was very, different. very, very different than now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, people would get on Twitter and just say, hey, going to go see a movie tonight or. Exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah. now they can blurp or, you know, word vomit their whole Although their whole vocabulary, I guess, you know, and what everything they want to say. So it's, it's yeah. completely changed. And of what yeah. the span of what, 10 years, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. Yeah. But this is, this is honestly, Chris, this is one of the reasons why I, I, I moved to the beach in Florida. Um, this may sound like a reach is that my wife and I just wanted to unplug and like, just, just 
and not and not physically, like literally unplug. Obviously, I'm connected to the internet. I, I work, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm consuming content through the internet. I don't pay for cable anymore. Um, I, I don't pay for kind of like aka mainstream media any of that anymore. I, I I'm very selective about the media that I consume. But but one of the reasons why I moved out here is because I just wanted a simpler life. I just wanted to walk on the beach and Friday after work, I wanted to grab a fishing pole and stand knee deep in water. And that would be the most complicated thing that I'd have that day. Yeah. And and that's what I got. Well, and it's and it's pretty cool. And because I was getting I was falling way too far down this rabbit hole of, you know, just just like all of the kind of the vitriol and negativity of the Twitters and negativity of all these other things and of the news and of this and just, and, and, and it was just like, okay, this is too much. There's gotta be a simpler way to live. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm living in a little beach house now. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're the only one because, you know, I think obviously Austin, Texas is blowing up right now. And then you know, and Florida was one of the States that was basically open during the pandemic. And I think people were kind of, uh, on the same boat with you just saying, Hey, you know, I just want to get out of all this and just go live that life that you were talking yeah. about. Just get away and like actually say, you know, you know, go to a restaurant without wearing a mask or even like where it was kind of so stupid where you had to wear a mask, then take it off while you eat and put it back on just to get up to the bathroom. And it's like, what are we doing here? You know, you know, as a society, we're, we're just, we're strange, man. Like, and, and if there's one thing that I learned out of COVID without getting too political is that when you're talking about, a nation, right? Like hundreds of millions of people, there's no subtlety and there's no nuance, right? Like if you're going to, you, you, the only way that you can, you can do anything is to try to do everything on mass with, on mass with these like kind of ridiculous catch-all rules that probably don't make any sense. Mm. But the only way that you're going to get 300 million, 400 million plus people to try to get anywhere close to this is, is that you, you, you everybody has to do it. And forget about it. Everybody's going to do this. And it may not even make that much sense. But the only way that you're going to even get close to having any sort of kind of adherence to it is just try to make everybody do it. And uh, yeah, we, there was no nuance. It was just this blunt force in instrument. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it was it was it, it was wild. Um, and, uh, you know, politically, I'm I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I am, I am a social liberal and a fiscal conservative. Ah, okay. I can, I, I can agree with that. I know what you mean. Which, which, which means I don't know what mean. box to check. Well, that's probably good. Cause and, I don't think it's a lot of people now. <laughs> right? well, well, and it, there, there's so it, many ideologies and things they're hearing now that like you were talking about, you know, polarization and stuff that, you know, there's really, really far left people. And that's, they get so far left that some people who are already, you know, liberal or on the left side, they're like, what the heck are we doing? And they kind of get pushed over to the right side a little bit more. And then it's the same thing for that, too. Like people who were so far right, you know, come out, start talking on Twitter, social media, whatever. Then it's like, hey, I'm, I don't know, man. Let me push myself a little bit back over here. And, and, the, and the weirdest thing about that is, I think, that the people on the extremes actually have a lot more in common than they are willing to admit. Right. I, I think that there's a lot more that, that holds us together than drives us apart. Mm. Um, it, it, interesting factoid. Um, only two years ago, I became a U.S. citizen. So I'm actually I was born right. in Canada, raised in Canada, went to undergrad in Canada, went to graduate school here. I had a green card for ever and ever. I had a green card for like almost 20 years and I've never voted. I've been paying taxes the entire time. I was like, you know what? This is home. This is where I want to be. This is the greatest country on the planet. This is, this is, is imperfect and it's got its challenges and it's got its warts and we, we've got difficulties that we need to figure out, but this is the place I want to be in. This is the greatest country in the world. So this is going to be home now. Nice. So um, I, I chose to become American, e even in the middle of all of this mayhem. And I had a lot of friends of mine who were like, wait a minute, hold on a second. You're, you're Canadian. You, why, get out now while you can, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, so run for the hills. What, why are you here? Like, go run, run, get yeah. out. You can still get out. It's not too late. It's like, come on. Like, uh, you know, there's there, this place still, this country just reeks of opportunity. Okay. And, and, and there is a lot of things that, that really actually really hold us together. And 
the funny the funny thing is about the people on the far left and the far and the far right they like to think that the problem is each other. Mm. And it's really, honestly, not. Most of the, most of the problems, the pro- most of the problems are economic in nature and have very, very little to do with political ideology, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned. So that makes sense. You, you've, you've, got, you've got people on the left and the, and the right who, who are, have been completely, completely ignored by both parties. You've got working class people who are getting ignored by both parties. You have both parties who consistently make choices for big companies, big pharma, big tech, for the military industrial complex, for, for, for all of these giant concerns, for big corporations and for the wealthiest of the wealthiest of the wealthy. Yeah. Everything that happened under COVID, there's a lot of things that happened under COVID, but one of the things that happened under COVID was a massive wealth shift from the people that d- didn't already have much to give, mm-hmm. right? And that's got like this giant vacuum that sucked up all that money and pushed it even more into the hands of the people of the haves, the extreme ends. Yeah. So you have, you have people who have incredible amounts of things in common, who are economically depressed, who are feeling overlooked, who don't have healthcare, who are having a hard time feeding their kids, One may be Republican and one may be Democrat. And the problem is not your neighbor. That's not that's not the problem. The problem is not your neighbor. The problem are these policies that are embraced by embraced openly by both parties to keep those people where they are in the overall kind of the the economic pyramid that we live in. So I, I think I think if 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 they have metaphorical speaking kind of have nots, whatever that means. But if the people who are struggling, right, if the people who aren't making ends meet, if the people who aren't getting, you know, supported in things like minimum wage and, and aren't getting access to reasonable health care or for heaven's sakes, even clean water, right? If those right. people figure out right. how to band together, well, then then the people at the top are going to have a problem because they're going to, they're, they're going to have to, they're going to have to answer for why they have been ignoring those millions and millions and millions and millions of people for so long. But as long as those people are pointing the figure at each other, as long as they're saying it's you red or it's you blue, then they're not pointing the figure up and saying, aha, wait a minute. Yep. It doesn't really matter who's in power. The money's flowing to the top. Of course. Okay. So I think I, I'm an optimistic of new American. I think yeah. that there's a lot of promise here. And I think that, that as imperfect as our system is, it is still the best form of government that's available out there. I lived for 25 years under a parliamentary system, completely broken, Yeah, completely wow. broken. Wow. This is still the best system. If you ask me. Well, I wanted to ask, I mean, and I didn't mean to go down a political soapbox. Oh yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. But, but I mean, I guess and this I, is what, this is just water. Oh, that's, yeah. It's like one of these Zevia drinks I'm drinking. So yeah. it's not good. Um, but you know, in terms of, I guess, politics, but also kind of bringing it back towards data management, data yeah. governance, that if people who disagreed on obviously political ideologies or whatever you want to say, and also, you know, there's practices that we kind of talked about earlier about gathering data and stuff like that, would it be yeah. better? Or what is your thoughts on if rather than talk about what you disagree on first and you're starting to point those fingers and everything, what if we actually talk about what we agreed on first? And then I feel like it would become like, hey, we actually kind of maybe agree on more things on more than we actually thought we were rather than just start already starting off on a bad, what is a bad foot here? Just disagreeing right off the bat. And totally and completely agree with you. Cool. Totally agree with you, particularly if, if you are looking through an economic lens and not necessarily kind of a, a, a social or a geographical lens, right? right? So yeah, I think I think we actually have more, way more, way more in common than we care to admit. And and I think that you know honestly, the data bears that out, right? That consistently, there's only two or three or four real issues within elections that that win or lose elections, right? And they're right. almost always consistently the same. So I, I think I think we have an awful lot in common. Um, I I think that, you know, the way to get there, yeah, data can help, but it's interesting over the last two major elections, the last two federal elections, the polls have been completely and totally wrong, right? Which, which, which I find fascinating, right? And I think they're going to be completely wrong again this time. You mean in terms of votes or? Yeah, yeah, polling. 
right? Well, like the, the polls. polls. Okay. Right? Okay. Like, okay, well, we're going to go out there and survey however many voters. I don't even know. It's clearly not enough. But they do it all the time, right? Where it was, um, you know, oh, well, uh, 2016, um, you know, no, no problem. Hillary's got it. Yep. Right? That's like, like yeah. it, it, that's exactly right. And that's exactly why in many... And looking back, that's why she didn't campaign very much in Wisconsin. She didn't campaign very much in Michigan. She didn't like because they're like, okay, it's done. Yeah. Right. I've 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 got it. Right. Yeah. The, the places where it, where Trump ended up winning is where the pollsters were saying that she was going to win. She didn't canvas there and ended up and totally and completely backfired. So that's one area where the data was completely and totally wrong. Why was the data completely and totally wrong? Well, it turns out people lie. People <laughs> they lie. Weird. Right. Right. And 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 when somebody and when somebody literally telephones you, right? Like I don't I don't even have a landline. I haven't had a landline for a long time. But if somebody telephones you and says, Yeah, hi, I'm Joe Blow with uh, you know, Political Science Corporation and I'd like your opinion on something, it turns out people actually uh, you know, don't tell the truth. <laughs> uh, 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 during that for sure right? which yeah which kind of gets into the bias and which gets into the kind of the human factor that we were talking about earlier with with the uh oh be you know 100 percent uh accurate in terms of you know we we polled 2,000 people and this is what they said but uh some of the human factors here can always come into play mm. Yeah, he, that and that was one of the. Uh, I was having some drinks with some friends one night, and we were talking about human factors over machines, and that if we were just to leave human emotion out of everything and let machines kind of pick through the data and yeah. run everything, basically to a to, to a sense that would maybe not the world, maybe not globally, but even just maybe start small in a state, city, whatever you want to say, but would they be better yeah. off because we're taking human emotion out of everything saying, no, if we're looking at stuff for the best of humanity, civilization, culture, society, whatever it is that, no, these is what we're going to do, you know, and not make, base these decisions off, you know, oh, wait, I'm not feeling too good today, or I kind of yeah. know more than these machines. Yeah. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. It's kind of what we said. <laughs> we, were like, we were right in the middle. We couldn't. We yeah, all had points. I mean, it's just that, you know, what, what do you do? Yeah. Sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is no. Right. Like the metaphor I, I use all the time. I'm not much of a boater, but I've, I've spent enough time in a boat. And the metaphor I use is that is that you can drive a boat off of the wake if you want to go in a straight line. True. Right. <laughs> if you're looking backwards and all you're looking at is your wake and the boat, you're not looking forwards. Chances are pretty good. You can hold it in a straight line. Okay. Right. 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 And and that's kind of the way that I look at. You know, are we going to defer to the machines to a certain degree because all data is past? Yeah. Now we can build models and we can start predicting the future, but these are predictions. But inherently, all data is past. Right. So. What I'm saying here is that if you completely turn it over to the machines, um, it would take some pretty sophisticated machines and some pretty sophisticated computer code if you wanted to, software code, I should say, showing my age, um, if you wanted to turn the boat. A good example would be um, diversity, inclusion, uh, or, or potentially even something like affirmative action. That's in the news these days. Apparently, the Supreme Court is looking at that. If you wanted to have a outcome that was independent of past data and past performance, mm. right? Would you allow a machine to do that, right? A good example is that there's, there's, a, there's, there's a case, I, I want to say that it was involving Apple. Uh, it's towards the end of a long day, so forgive me if I, if I get it wrong, yeah. but the, the, the context is, is largely correct. There were a wife and a, a husband and a wife had applied individually for, I want to say it was an Apple credit card. Okay. And the husband got approved to X credit and the wife got approved to Y credit, even though they're married. Now the machine didn't know that they were married and based on the data and the data alone, the decision to give the wife lower credit was justified. Right. But is that a just outcome? Yeah. Right? If they if these if these folks are married, if their finances are completely and totally conjoined, 
right? Now, now you could have a, 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 you could say, okay, well, wait a minute. Well, then, you know, the machine just didn't have a data point. The machine should have known that they were married and should have made a decision based that they were married. I would ask. But there, there, there was an angle here around, you know, the, the question then became, okay, well, wait a minute, why did they get a different credit rating if their incomes are the same? But by the way, their, their income had been reported as largely the same. All of their financials were largely the same, but the man got preferential treatment over the woman mm. from a credit rating perspective. Okay. Right. Because it, it had appeared and they had figured this out somehow, and this is why it ended up going to court. It had appeared somehow that the algorithm was making a decision. It was not a human. It was an algorithm. that was making the credit decision had basically uh, given more weight uh, and favored the male versus the female in that case. Right. So that's one great example of, OK, well, that's not a just outcome. And we don't want the machines to be biased and we don't want the machines to be racist and we don't want the machines to make bad decisions. But sometimes if you're just looking back, right, and if you're just looking at the data, uh, I think sometimes that would actually be the outcome, but it wouldn't be the outcome that you would want. Right. This is this is kind of largely tied to a field known as ethical A.I., so there's a whole kind of growing field in my world of uh, kind of, you know, people who are looking at the morality and, and the ethics of what happens when you let machines decide based on, on data, right, that, that does not take human factors into consideration. Yeah. And that, that, that has a hard time dealing with historical bias or historical pre uh, prejudice because it's just looking at data and it doesn't necessarily know the full context because it's just a computer, mm -hmm. right? So if you're trying to solve for that, or if you're trying to fix for that, if you're trying to course correct, if you're trying to turn the boat, uh, maybe maybe leaving it to the robots is not always a good idea. Yeah. Well, well, to your point, though, I think to talk about affirmative action, I think the Supreme Court, I can't read, are they voting on it or have they just passed it? But, you know, I used to work in higher education, but now I think certain yeah. uh, colleges are not allowing or not. Or, or cannot anymore now put down like, hey, what race you are on application right. along that line. So I, I think yeah. there's a case before the court. I, I want to say it's for uh, University of North Carolina and yeah, you're right. It was a was it Yale or yeah Harvard? yeah Harvard? it was yeah Harvard. I think it was Harvard, Harvard and, yep. and, and, would, and, it, and it, it's about preference um, from an admissions perspective that could have cascading effects even into things like kind of like corporate. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies, right? Because it could have a chilling effect, um, not just in college administrations, but in things like you know individual hiring uh, policies within corporations. So, yes, I'm, I saw something the other day. I don't think that that's actually been. I don't think the decision has actually been rendered there. Yeah, I couldn't remember if it was passed or right. not. Or no, right. I, think I think it's still. I think it's still being. There, there were arguments that were heard a couple of days ago. So I don't. I think it'll be a little while before the court actually renders the decision on it. But um, you know, I, I only raised that just just within the context of talking about data. Um, is that again, the, you know, data is in the past, right? And and how how do you if 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 the data is a result of bias and prejudicial processes, um, then then how do you fix for that in the future? That's a good question. Right. You know, at least from a machine perspective, I know how we fix it. I know, I know how we as humans fix it. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things out there. I mean, but you know, could you turn a car com or uh, could you turn a computer? Um, could you, could you allow a computer to drive your car entirely? 100%. Um, I think that there's data a growing body of data suggests that computers will make superior decisions to people just about almost all the time. Mm. Well, but would it matter though too, like who is designing the software, the coding, too. Oh well, it's so this this whole area is to me this is fascinating, right? Which is um, right now, if I, me human being, if I do something stupid and I break the law, or I may even just I I, I, I may do something stupid to somebody, even not willfully, sure. right? Sure. Um, and that the, the person, the other, the, the injured person sues me or takes me to court or I get arrested. Well, then I'm accountable. It's me. I did the stupid thing. But what happens if the stupid thing is computer code? Yeah. Right. Like messed up. Right. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like what happens if I'm walking down the street and a self-driving Tesla, the, the, the software burps. I don't know. Yeah, right? glitches Just, up or something. You know, whatever, yeah. something. It, it <laughs> hears wildly and it and it breaks both my legs and I'm unable to work for 10 years. For sure. And I sue 
uh, I, I sue Tesla, right? It, who's ultimately responsible for that? Is it Tesla? Is it the person that wrote the code? Yeah, is it Elon? That's a good question. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I'd probably sue Tesla for sure, but I would probably also, I don't, I don't know, I, would I go after the individual software engineer that wrote that code? I don't doubt it, right? Most yeah. Go so, after the big guys, like the head honchos, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's that's interesting. Like, that's if, a good point, if, though. That's a great point. Right. Like, like where, where does the liability rest for that? Yeah. I would have never would have thought about making that point, but that's perfectly, you know, makes perfect sense is what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, yeah. whoever designed that and why was it, you know, why did it glitch up or whatever? Was it because there right. was a error in the code of some sort that nobody caught? And then now it's just a freak of what a freak accident happened. And that's why we caught right. it now. Yeah. But I guess, you know, obviously Tesla or, everyone would go after Tesla as a whole and not that actual first guy, right? I mean, Probably. That's just Probably. how it always goes, right? Just because it's always, yeah. you know, if you trip and fall in McDonald's, right? Nobody's going to go go after the manager. They usually just go after the corporation. Yeah. Right? But they, I mean, I, I, could, I could imagine a world where, you know, I suspect a big reason why a lot of companies that weren't Tesla didn't get into self-driving cars was for the, for the very reason of liability. Yeah. Well, didn't he even say that it's almost impossible to actually have a full autonomous car right now that it's just not there and it never will be there. I thought somebody was talking about that and this, and that's why Elon's kind of moved on to different things that he's like, all right, this is kind of as good as I, I can get it. No, I don't know. So he's, so, he's, so he's like, he's, he's drilling holes under Las Vegas or, or and LA the tunnels and stuff. Yeah. The, the boring company. That's I, I like that one. Right. <laughs> oh, re, oh, okay. Double entendre boring. I get it. Yeah. Drilling a hole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice but apparently that's open i saw some i've seen some like youtube videos or something where people are really? like taking taking the tunnel it's like there's one that's open in vegas now that goes from like the south end of the strip to the north end of the strip i, I think I, I yeah i gotta look at that well because i've been hearing that hearing about that for years so i would assume that maybe it's starting to come open yeah for yeah, at least four yeah. or five years i've been hearing about that so because it's yeah you know, people make the whole arguments just like how can one man you know you know bore those tunnels Run Tesla now SpaceX now yeah, it's, it's not he's not he's 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 just he's got amazing management teams and he's got he's got great people working for him because sure. there's there's only so many hours in a day sure right yeah, yeah. it's tough for and, one person to do all that but I've listened to him on a couple of podcasts you know and he's you know told the host you know hey you know I don't want nobody to have my brain basically because it's just so much go I mean it might it could be just being a little bit egocentric obviously but. Mm, yeah maybe i wouldn't mind having his money oh i don't think no <laughs> yeah i think most people would right well right but no i mean you know it, it, hats off right like um you know people are looking at the the twitter deal and are saying that uh you know it, it was financially it's a, it's a poor deal and it was a bad decision and Paying forty-four billion dollars when a lot of a lot of the kind of the kind of the industry know-it-alls are saying it may have been worth maybe sure. fifteen, maybe twenty. Why did he pay two x? Uh, honestly, I'll say if there's one guy that could make it work and that could figure it all out, he's probably the guy. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's what everyone's saying. I had a little camera issue right there, fell over, but no worries. <laughs> yeah, but just uh, yeah, nobody know. I think that's the only thing that, like we said earlier, that was only really the reason he wanted to clean up Twitter, and that's why he bought it. But again. The why is our price like on like we were talking about being free and stuff? Forty four billion. I mean, who made that number up? You know, well, pretty, yeah, I, public yeah. shares. I don't know, but anyway. Well, yeah, I, think, I mean, I think that was the floor, right? It was the it was the kind of the book value of the company with with an inflation factor on top of that. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, if if there's one person that will be, you know, I I think you know is uniquely qualified to try to turn that thing around is that guy. Gotcha. Well. Malcolm, I didn't mean for this podcast to go down a whole Elon Musk political talk, but I, we know we're about an hour in here, and I don't want to, I want to be respectful of your time and all that good stuff. So I, I appreciate it. I, you know, I'm I'm glad to have the conversation. I honestly think, Chris, right, like this is this is me with the new American hat again, um, you know, and, and the guy that chooses to be here. I I think, you know, I don't have any magic answers, that's for sure, um. But I do think that the way to, to make a more perfect union is to be talking about it more. Sure. Well, right. it's like, you know, I've heard somebody say that, you know, we are the United States. And if we all come together, kind of what you were saying earlier, you know, we can instead of pointing fingers and being polarization and all that 
terrible stuff. If we all come together with one common goal that we can make things happen, like getting water, clean water back in Flint, Michigan or wherever it's at, you know, it's Jackson, like, Mississippi. I yeah, mean, like how, how hard we can do this. Be? Yeah. Like, why is this not being it's taken not. care of right now? We just don't, I just don't, I'm just, in what we're coming into 2023 now. And it's still, those two cities don't have clean water. Uh, there, there's so, there's so many other things that that I think if we if we set our minds to it we are capable of great great things, and I don't think my neighbor is my enemy, right at all. I I, I think my neighbor is my friend, and if we work together, we can do a lot of good stuff. So it's all good. Well, I think that's a good way to take this podcast home right there on that good note right there. So um, sounds good, Malcolm. If you got anything you want to plug or people want to find you or anything like that. Feel free to do that. Please, please try to, if, if you have any interest at all about data, data management, master data management, data quality, learning more about the whole data thing, please find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think there's only three Malcolm Hawkers on the planet. As long as you get my first, first name spelled correctly, M-A-L-C-O-L-M, there's a second L there. Come find me on LinkedIn. I would love to engage more of these conversations, talk about data, talk about anything. Um, I've got a podcast as well. It's the CDO matters podcast, but let's connect on LinkedIn and go from there. Cool. Well, man, thanks for the conversation. You're a badass dude. This was fun for me. I really enjoyed it. And just thanks. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Chris. Good to see you out of here, folks. Good night. All right. Good night. all.